Hi, welcome back to Fecam GNT Histology Slide Series. Hope you are doing good. I am Akela Busaya, and today we will be going through the slides of oral tissues and salivary glands. We start with the slide of the lip. The lip is the outer part of the oral tissue, and it has two parts the skin side and the vermilion zone. These two parts are demarcated by a rim of pale skin known as the vermilion border. Now this border might not be distinctly identifiable in the epithelial part of the lip because both the skin side and the vermilion zone have keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So this border is more identifiable by the appendages present in the skin side. Now in the skin side of the lip, there are always air follicles which appear which can appear in different planes depending on how the tissue was sectioned. Now this is a this is a air follicle, this is another air follicle. So there are three different planes in which these air follicles can appear. It can have it like this. Or like this. like this depending on how they lay when the tissue was sectioned now if the follicle lay in a longitudinal plane when the tissue was sectioned it's going to appear like this just like what we are seeing here it's going to appear like this but if it's laid in a transverse plane when the tissue was sectioned it's going to appear like this and if it laid in a slant plane when the tissue was sectioned it's going to appear like this so you can see this as this then this as this so appearance of any of these three planes still represents the air follicle also in this clean side there are sweat glands so the point at which you stop seeing the air follicle which this is this air follicles here, then this is a air follicle, then beyond this point, we can no more see air follicle. So this point at which we stop seeing air follicle represents the vermilion border. So beyond this vermilion border, so beyond this vermilion border, we now we at which is the which this part now is devoid of air follicle and then sweat can we can answer that this is the vermilion zone. So this zone is a part of the lip that appears red and in its gross appearance and this red color is derived from the fact that the dermis of this vermilion zone is richly vascularized so this zone also has this thin lightly keratinized epidermal covering so beyond this part that we stop seeing air follicle is the vermilion zone let's check out what we can see here in this slide we can identify the epithelial part of the leaf as this then moving inwards we can observe that there is no part of the slide that is devoid of air follicle so we can see this is air follicle this air follicle this air follicle this one here here this one here so throughout the slide there are air follicles meaning that the slide shows just the skin side of the lip with no visible vermilion border or any vermilion zone. So you can see, so this is the epithelial part and then just the air follicles in the transverse and then slant plane. Here we have the same issue. There is no part of the slide that is devoid of air follicle. So you can see this is the air follicle here. This is another one. Then even this part, this is another one. So this shows just the skin parts of the lip. Mostly the air follicles present in the skin side of the lip are actually in the trousers plane or the slant plane. So we can see in our slide, this is a air follicle, this is another air follicle, this is another air follicle. And then we can observe that this air follicle stops here. This means that the slide has both the skin side of the lip and then the vermilion zone of the lip. 
so we can see that this is the skin side and then this is the vermilion zone so the boundary between these two sides or these two parts is this part so this part represents the vermilion border here we can identify this as the epithelium of the lip and then we can see that there's a small portion without a follicle so this is the vermilion zone so the pointer seems to be pointing to the vermilion border so we can see that these other things that we can identify here is the these are the air follicles so we should know that since the vermilion zone is devoid of sweat gland and sebaceous gland it requires continuous moisturing by saliva to prevent cracking so what's the sole reason for identification of the lip this reason for identification is just the presence of the vermilion border this is a slide of the tongue the tongue is a muscular organ covered by oral mucosa and then a v-shaped groove known as the sulcus terminalis divides the tongue into an anterior to third and a posterior one third most of the slides of the tongue produced are from the anterior to third now the mucosa of the anterior to third is formed into papillae of three types one is the filiform papillae which is the most numerous and this these are the filiform papillae then two is the fungiform papillae and then the third one is the circumvallate papillae which are usually arranged just anterior to the sulcus terminalis so the filiform papillae usually appear like an inverted cone and they give the slide of the tongue its flame of fire appearance so this Things we are seeing, these are the filiform papillae. Now, this part of the slide shows the muscles of the tongue. And the fungiform papillae usually appear like a mushroom, and they are actually scanty in number. In this particular slide, there is no fungiform papillae to show how scanty they are. Another slide of the tongue. We note the flame of fire appearance or tongue of fire appearance of the Papillae, and then we can see the underlying muscular parts of the tongue. Here we can note the inverted cone structures as the filiform form papillae, and then giving the slide its flame of fire appearance. Then we can see the pointer pointing to one of the papillae, and then we can see this as the muscular part of the tongue. Now, in the midst of numerous filiform papillae, we can see a mushroom-like papilla, which indicates the fungiform papilla. We can see here this one, which the arrow is pointing to. So this is a fungiform papilla. Now, what are the reasons for identification of the tongue? One is the presence of the filiform papillae. Then you can also say the presence of the fungiform papillae. We move to the slide of the salivary gland. There are three major salivary glands: one, the parotid gland; two, the sublingual gland; and three, the submandibular gland. Two types of secretory cells are found in the salivary gland: the serous cells and then the mucous cells. The parotid gland contains almost exclusively of serous cells and then they produce a thin watery secretion the sublingual glands have predominantly mucous secreting cells and then they produce a viscid secretion the submandibular gland contains both serous and mucous secreting cells so they produce a secretion of intermediate consistency now, there, this slide is actually the slide of the parotid gland. The parotid gland is usually divided into numerous lobes by connective tissue cell, the septa. As you can see, these are the septa, and then these are the lobes. Now, most of the ducts of the parotid glands are in this septa. Most of the ducts are in this septa, and only few can be seen in the lobe. And when these dots are seen, they are stained as deep as the gland or sometimes lighter. 
Now the parotid gland is therefore characterized by its numerous lobo and then the deep pink stain with H and E. In this, you can identify the lobos of the parotid gland and then the gland itself staining deep pink. It appears to have some ducts within the lobos of the of the gland which are stained as deep as the substance of the gland but they are few in number as you can see in this slide this is one this is another one this is an, even another one this one is big this is a higher manipulation of the parotid gland we can identify the serous arsenide that make up the parotid gland as well as the serous cells so this is a serous arsenus, this is another serous arsenus, this is another serous arsenus. Then we can see the serous cells that make up the arsenus. Here the serous cells can be identified by the pink stained cytoplasm, which when compared with the cytoplasm of the duct cells, they both have almost the same color intensity. So we can see, take for example, taking this cell, we can see this pink cytoplasm or this pink cytoplasm of the cell and then comparing to the cytoplasm of the dot cells you can see that because this is the duct so we can see that they are pink and then with almost the same color intensity also the nuclei of the serous cells are a little more centrally placed you can see that they are a little more centrally placed in the cell than that of the mucous cells which we are going to see later which are usually basally placed in such a way that they are really seen in relation to their cytoplasm so we can see this particular cells in serous cells they are nuclei and you can see the nucleus of this particular cell now is much more centrally placed in the cytoplasm than what we are going to see in the mucous cells also the deep pink stain of the serous cell cytoplasm is characteristic of relatively all the cells that we can see on the slide. Differentiating this particular slide from the slide of the submandibular gland which has uniform number of both serous and uh, mucous cells. So in if it was a slide of the of the submandibular gland we are going to see some of the mucous cells that have a very very pale cytoplasm. So we can also note the purple dots of the of this particular the purple dots of this particular dot cells, and these purple dots are actually representing the nuclei of the dot cells. Now we can compare the color of this nucleus to the color of this nucleus. You can see that they have also similar color intensity. Here we identify the numerous lobules. You can see the lobules of the parotid gland and then the dividing septum. Then we can also see the characteristic deep pink stain of the gland with little or no visible ducts in the lobules. This also shows the parotid gland and here we can see the numerous lobules and then the dividing septa with the deep pink stain of the slide. So what are the reasons for identification of the Parotid gland. The main reason for education of the parotid gland is just the presence of predominantly serous arsenide. We have here the slide of the sublingual gland. As said earlier, the sublingual gland has predominantly mucous secreting cells. So these mucous cells only take up light stains on each and E, just as what we can see on our slide. They tend to now appear pale. The nuclei of these mucous cells are basically placed in the cell such that they are really seen in relation to the cytoplasm. Unlike what we saw in the serous cells where the nuclei are centrally placed. If we take this arsenus, for example, this mucous arsenus, we can see that this is a cell of one of the mucous, this is a, this is a nucleus of one of the mucous cells. And then we can see how the, mu, the nucleus is basically placed close to the basement membrane of that arsenus. Taking this arsenus as another, another example, we can see how the nuclei of these mucous cells are arranged just to the base of the cells. So unlike what we saw in the serous cells. Sometimes one can confuse this slide of the sublingual gland with that of the lungs or adipose tissue. 
But once you note that, unlike those other two, the so-called space that we are seeing here is looks clumsy. It has a clumsy appearance representing the mucous acinus. You can see because of the fact that it is pale and then just, but it's unlike what we saw in both the adipose tissue and the lungs, where this particular space just have them. Um, it appears plain with nothing contained in it. Here it appears clumsy, showing that there is a presence of the mucous cells and then the cytoplasm of these cells. For the sublingual gland, they, you can see from this slide that it really appears in, in lobus, unlike what we see in the parotid gland. And then the duct of the gland are most times seen in the, in the substance of the gland, just as what we can see here, we can see the ducts. And one thing we should notice is that these ducts are usually stained much deeper than the gland. So you can see how it is stained deep purple than what we see in the substance of the gland itself. So we can you can see that one of the characteristic of the sublingual gland is that the duct stains more than the gland. This is also the slide of the sublingual gland. We can see the clumsy nature of the so-called space representing the mucous acini, which is made up of the mucous cells that takes up light stains on each and e. And then we can also identify this as a duct and then we can see how it's, it is stained more than the substance of the gland. Another slide of the sublingual gland, here we can see the mucous acini scattered all over the gland which are pale stained and because you can see they are pale stained. And then we can see a pointer pointing to a particular deep stained structure. This is the duct. So you can see how distinctly stained deep stained the duct is compared to the mucous acini. So what is the reading for identification for the sublingual gland? The main reason for identification is the presence of predominantly mucous acini. This is a slide of the submandibular gland. Basically in this gland there are both mucous and serous acini and that the gland is characterized by the presence of numerous ducts in its substance. And these ducts, unlike what we have in the sublingual gland, tend to stain just as much as the gland. Therefore, the color of the substance of the gland and the color of the duct have similar intensity. It is because of this appearance of the duct of the submandibular gland that it is given the appellation hole in the hole for easy identification. So we have, take for example, we have a O here, then we have another O inside here, and then the borders of these two holes have similar color intensity. Looking deep into the substance of the gland, we can note some parts of both deep and um, light stained acinine, even distributed across the slide, showing that we have the serous and then the mucous acinine. The submandibular gland can also appear in lobus, but not as much as that of the parotid gland. And unlike in the parotid gland, there are numerous ducts seen in the lobus of the submandibular gland. And then these ducts have the characteristic all in a whole appearance and then staining as much as the gland. This is also the submandibular gland. We can see the numerous ducts with uniform color with the gland and then its characteristic all in a whole appearance scattered throughout the slide. This is a iron magnification and then we can see the serous and the mucous parts of the submandibular gland then we can also see the ducts here we can see the numerous ducts and then it's all in the whole appearance and then we can see the substance of the gland both of them having similar color intensity another slide of the submandibular gland and this time at the higher magnification given the serous part of the gland which is deep stained and then the mucous part of the gland which is pale stained here and then we can note the ducts of the gland. So the main reason for identification for the submandibular gland is the presence of a codominance of both the mucous and then the serous acini. So in summary, we can say when the duct stains more than the gland, we think of the sublingual gland. And then when there is hole in the whole appearance, with the duct staining as much as the gland, we think of the submandibular gland. This is where we are going to stop for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.